Hi everyone and welcome to this week's War's End History Story. This week I am covering a little bit of information about the life of Charles Algernon Parsons and the Tabinia. This is not a full history of his entire life or the ship's entire life in great detail, but I hope you will still enjoy it and find it interesting. Like a lot of people who are well known in the various industries of Wall's End, Charles was not born here, so a lot of his story will not be about Wall's End, but I felt I needed to add the details to really be able to tell about his life. Charles was born on June the 13th, 1854 in London. His father was the apparently famous astronomer William Parsons, the third Earl of Rossi. Unfortunately, this is about all I know about his father, as although I did do a little search, I was not really able to find anything more out about him. The photo that you can see on screen at the moment shows Charles in his younger days. However, I don't actually know how old he was at the time. And often trying to guess someone's age in these old photos can be incredibly difficult, as people often looked a lot older than they really were. So I'm basically not saying that this photo is representative of Charles in 1877, which is the next date that I'm going to mention. So as said, in 1877, Charles, having graduated from Cambridge with a first class honours degree, joined the Newcastle-based engineering firm of W.J. Armstrong as an apprentice. Now, apparently this was seen as an unusual thing for the son of an earl to do, and no doubt he was expected to follow a completely different line of work. But it does seem that this was the kind of thing that Charles was much more interested in. He would later move to a company known as Kitson's in Leeds, where he worked on rocket-powered torpedoes. And I have to admit that when I first read that part of the information, I had thought it had said that he worked on rockets, which I thought was pretty amazing for the 1800s. So it definitely made me look more closely when doing research, as I would have hated to have said that he worked on rockets and then found out that I was completely wrong and made myself look dafter than I already am. In January of 1883, Charles married a lady by the name of Catherine Bethel. She was the daughter of William Bethel and had been born in Yorkshire, and she had first met Charles in Leeds in 1882 when he'd been working there as an engineer. After their marriage, the couple would go on to have two children together, and when they were first married, it is said that Catherine would often go with Charles on his early morning, sometimes around 7am, lake trials on his prototype torpedoes. Their first of their children, Rachel Mary Parsons, was born in 1885 and was actually an engineer herself, so she clearly had the same interests as her father, and she would later take over the running of his company, well, the directorship of his company, for a while after her brother had been called up to fight during World War I. Their son, Algernon George Tommy Parsons was born in around 1886. Now, unfortunately, I haven't been able to find any photos of their son. And sadly, Algernon, who was better known apparently as Tommy, was killed in action during World War I in 1918 at the age of just 31 years. In 1884, Charles began working for Clark Chapman and Company, ship engineer manufacturers based near Newcastle. I think they were actually based in Ryden. Here, he became head of their electrical equipment development. And it would also be here that he would develop the famous steam turbine engine. Now, a lot of the information about this is quite technical, so I'm not going to try and explain any of that as I am sure I would just tie myself up in knots and no one would have a clue what I was talking about, including myself. So I will just basically move on to the next stage in Charles's life. In 1889, he founded C.A. Parsons and Company in Newcastle. This company was set up to produce turbo generators to his design. Now, I know that most of you will probably remember Parsons on Shields Road, and this was indeed the factory that he set up. 
His son, Algernon, had joined the company as a director, as mentioned earlier, but had left when he had been called up for service at the beginning of World War I and had, as I mentioned before, been replaced by his sister, Rachel. So it does seem that the business was very much a family affair. Now, of course, up to this point, it has probably been hard to spot the War's End connection with this story, but the most important part is still to come, and this part is very much connected to War's End. In 1897, Charles founded the Parsons Marine Steam Turbine Company, based in War's End. Now, I know that many of you will know someone who worked there, and this was actually the place that my dad went to work when he first left school many years ago, and when he was only around about 15 years old. Now, Parsons Marine did not actually build the famous Tabinia. However, the company was founded on the strength of this ship, which had actually been built in 1884 by the War's End Company Brown and Hood, who were not too far away on the riversides from Parsons Marine itself. And the Tabinia was powered by the steam turbine engines that had been invented by Charles Parsons. When she was first built, the Tabinia was easily the fastest ship in the world at the time. However, she didn't actually start out that way as when she was launched in 1894, which was some 10 years after she was built, she only had one propeller and this it seems did not give the ship much speed at all. So after some changes, she ended up with a total of nine propellers and this gave her at trials a speed of 34 knots or 39 miles per hour, which made her very fast indeed. And in June of 1897, the Tabinia made a surprise visit at the Royal, uh, sorry, at the Navy Review for the Diamond Jubilee of Queen Victoria. And in front of the Prince of Wales, foreign dignities, dignitaries, gosh, I couldn't say that, and Lords of the Admiralty, Tabinia, which was much faster than any other ship at the time, is said to have raced between the two lines of Navy ships and steamed up and down in front of the crowd. None of the other ships present were able to catch her. And it would seem this, which can truly only really be described as a publicity stunt, meant that Tabinia finally caught the eye of the Admiralty. And after they attended further time trials, they were eventually convinced to add steam turbines to their ships. And by 1905, the Royal Navy confirmed that all of their future ships would be powered by steam turbine. In 1907, the Tabinia nearly came to a sticky end. She had been hit by a ship that had been launched from the south side of the Tyne. And as you can see from the photo of the accident on screen at the moment, this did quite cause quite a lot of damage. But luckily, she was repairable and she was safely able to steam alongside the other famous war's end ship, the Mauritania, a little later in 1907. Now, as you can see from this photo, the difference in size of these two ships is immense. The Mauritania looks enormous and the tiny Tabinia, which you can just see towards the front of the ship. No, I'm not even going to try shipping terms. Mine are front and back and that's the best I can do you. The Tabinia looks more like a boat that should be sitting in your bathtub than sitting on the Tyne. Sadly, some mechanical issues with the Tabinia meant she was unable to accompany the Mauritania on her trip down the Tyne and out to sea. Later, the Tabinia would be removed from the water in the hope of stopping the deterioration of her bodywork. She was offered to the Science Museum in London in 1926 to be used as an exhibition. However, they were not able to use the full ship as they did not have enough space. So she was basically cut in half and the remaining part of the ship went on display in 1944 in Exhibition Park in Newcastle. Eventually, the two halves of the ship would be reunited and the Tabinia is now on display at the Discovery Museum in Newcastle, first being put on display there in around 1996. Now I have visited the museum and seen the ship and it really is a worth a visit if you haven't been before. 
when you think that the steam turbine engines in this little tiny ship would go on to change the history of shipbuilding in the early 1900s, it really does make this very special ship worth checking out. And the photos that you've seen on screen at this point were ones I took when I visited a few years ago. Now I remember that my dad told me that he had once done some work on the ship in her later years and I do wonder if anyone listening ever worked on her when she was put back together for want of a better way to describe it and if you did or if you know anyone who worked on her then do please let me know in the comments below. Returning back now to Charles Parsons, he died on February the 11th, 1931, at the age of 76, while he was on board the steamship Duchess of Richmond, while on a cruise with his wife. His cause of death was said to be neuritis, and I won't attempt to explain what this is, other than to say it is a disease that affects the nervous system. A memorial service was held for Charles at Westminster Abbey in London on March 3rd, 1931. Charles himself was buried in St Bartholomew's Church in Kirk Wellington, which was his parish church as the family had been living in the area at the time of his death. His widow Catherine died just two years later in 1933 and the couple are buried side by side in the churchyard. The family also had a home in London but it seems they preferred the Northumberland countryside to the hustle and bustle of London. I have to admit that when I visited the church some time ago, I had no idea that it was the burial place of someone who had once been so well known in Moore's End. The couple's only remaining child, Rachel, who had never married and had no children, died on the 2nd of July 1956, age 71. There is a somewhat sad and tragic story surrounding her death. However, I won't go into full detail about it, just simply stating that she had been found dead at home under suspicious circumstances and former employee Dennis Pratt would later be charged with her murder and at his trial he was found guilty of manslaughter where it was stated that he had been provoked by Rachel to some extent. However, having only done a very quick search into this, the only information that I found whilst doing the very quick search was that Dennis had gone to the house seeking his lawful payment and Rachel had sworn at him, called him names, insulted him, and that she may have also hit him with her handbag. Dennis was sentenced to 10 years in prison for her manslaughter. The judge said that the jury had taken a lenient view of his case by not finding him guilty of murder. And although this is not directly connected to our story, I did want to include this last little bit of information about the Parsons family. I do hope that you have enjoyed this little video and that you have found it interesting. Often when those who are well known in War's End, such as Charles Parsons, are, but are not born here, you do find that their information will be a little less War's End connected than the thing they were known for. But Charles Parsons, the Turbinia and Parsons Marine are indeed still very important parts of War's End's history. I do thank you all very much for watching and this video did come out a little bit longer than I was expecting so I hope you have stuck with it to the end and I do hope to see you all again very soon.